Hello, everyone. Welcome to Aerodynamics. This is one of my favorite topics to discuss, and I hope you'll enjoy it as well. We're going to break this up into uh, several smaller chunks so that you can um, go back and review things, you know, specific topics that you want to see. We're going to start out with fundamentals, just talking about fluid properties. These things are uh, stuff you should have seen before, and I should say, by way of um, introduction, um, as a prereq, you should have taken some sort of uh, introductory fluids or aerodynamics class. This is a graduate level course building on uh, some introductory knowledge of fluids as well as mathematics and programming, kind of typical engineering prerequisites. So um, for a, say a beginner entry level graduate class. Let's first talk about density. Uh, in some sense, density is relatively straightforward conceptually, right? If I have a control volume, so imagine I create this volume and we just go outside somewhere and I draw, you know, imagine I could draw in space this volume and I could just add up the mass of all of the air molecules that are in that volume, then I would get a density measurement. Of course, that would be very difficult as I described it, but just conceptually, right, we could do that. Um, the difficulty with this approach is that, uh, uh, besides actually counting molecules, is that I have to decide what size of volume should I use. And that's actually not so obvious. Imagine that my volume is, say, this big, and then I increase it and make it really big, or I make it the size of a house or a building, and I increase it further still. You can imagine that if I were to plot this, say, density row on one uh, axis. And this is the volume that I used to measure um, on the other axis that, you know, ideally we might expect that this should just be a straight line, right? I mean, the density should be constant, but we know that there's gonna be spatial variation, right? Even in this room, say there's a, a heater vent over there that uh, as I change the size of my volume, the density may vary somewhat. Right? And especially as I go outside in different parts of the atmosphere, it's going to change. So even though I think it should be constant, oops, draw that straighter, at some scale, as it gets bigger and bigger, there's going to be some fluctuation. And I don't know exactly what that will look like, but it should be relatively smooth and slow varying, but some fluctuation. And so because of that, we often say, well, density is a measurement in the limit as the volume goes to zero. Uh, that's also problematic though, right? Because the fluid is actually not a continuum, not, a, not continuous. It has made up of individual molecules. So imagine if my control volume is so small that there's only like two air molecules in it, right? Because it's just so tiny. And then I make it slightly bigger and this third air molecule jumps in. So now, my density just went up by 50%, even though my volume just changed slightly. So it was kind of constant for a bit, and then it jumped. And then as I increase a little more, suddenly it will jump again as I get another air molecule. We're talking about very, very small sizes, but conceptually we can do that. So, you know, there's going to be some erratic behavior at these small scales. And eventually we expect that that will start to um, converge, right? As I get to the point where I now have millions of particles then it's not gonna be sensitive at all, right? If I've got millions of particles and I change my volume a little bit, uh, there's so many particles that yes, I gained some, I lost some or whatever, but uh, it's gonna be essentially a continuous matter at that point. And this is the point at which we call the fluid a continuum. And so we kind of wanna to go to the limit, not to zero, but towards uh, this region here, this sort of small volume where we can still treat it as a continuum. And for air at standard conditions, just to give you some sense, this is not an important number for you to know, but just to give you a sense, this is about a micron in size. So one times 10 to the minus six meters a cube with that type of dimensions, it'll have about 30 million molecules in it. So a very large number, large enough that, you know, our density measurement is gonna be constant um, with changes in volume uh, nearby. And I should say, this is a log scale, right, of volume, because we're going from very tiny to very big. 
Okay, so density, uh, for everything we'll do in this class and really almost everything in aerodynamics, this continuum hypothesis is very appropriate. Uh, one exception is at very high altitudes um, where the density is so low, right, that the air molecules are actually pretty far apart so that um, to get my control volume that contains millions of particles, uh, I'm actually getting out to fairly large sizes, right, not microns, to where they, the sizes are comparable to the sizes of my engineering vehicles of interest. So, um, uh, so, so that's, that's one rare case if you're doing uh, aerodynamic analyses at very, very high altitudes. Okay, let's talk about pressure. Pressure, another fundamental fluid property. Um, we could think of it many ways. Um, one, again, kind of is aided by this molecular view. Imagine I have a solid surface and I have this air molecule and it comes in and impacts this surface, this wall, and it rebounds, right? There was some momentum exchange, right? I, I exchanged momentum proportional to the mass of that molecule and the velocity it came at. And so that exchange of momentum uh, that I imparted to the solid surface uh, exerts a pressure on it, right? And so pressure, let's just look at units here. Let me go back to black. Uh, units, pressure is a, uh, let's say it's a force for area. Again, as a limit as that area becomes really small, but not too small that it's no longer a continuum. So force per area and force is gonna be a momentum uh, change per time. So I've got momentum, which is mass times velocity, divided by time, divided by an area, uh, and that's a pressure. So we could say that this is proportional to density times velocity squared, right? So I get one velocity from the momentum uh, mass per area and then I get another, I, I can add a spatial dimension on top and bottom, right? So this becomes uh, a volume on the bottom and then I have a, a distance divided by time, so I get a velocity. Um, this is something you've seen in an undergraduate fluids class, right? We often talk about the, talk about the dynamic pressure where we put a one half here by convention, one half over V squared, that's the dynamic pressure. But just in terms of units, right, we could say that pressure is proportional to the density and the velocity squared. Another we could look at this is that uh, uh, the mean kinetic energy of an air particle, um, which is V squared, right, is, is uh, the kinetic energy, is proportional to temperature. Okay, so we could say it's proportional to density times temperature. And for an ideal gas, you know, we have this proportionality constant R. Um, specific gas constant. So we see the pressure rises from this exchange of momentum and particles, but what about in the middle of the room, right? We visualize this as hitting a wall. Right here in space, there's still a pressure, but there's no wall, right? I could put a control volume right here. How does that work? At first glance, we might think, well, the molecules collide with each other, so there's a pressure exerted there, but that's doesn't fully describe it. In fact, for an ideal gas, the assumption of ideal gas is that there are no collisions in molecules, and we don't need any to, do, to explain this. Um, one way you could think about it, again, we're getting to a continuum. So we have so many particles that statistically, uh, we have, let's say, about the same number leaving this control volume as there are entering. And there's so many that they're leaving in all directions, but they're also entering in all directions. So in other words, you could say that for any one particle that's leaving in, say, a given direction, there's going to be another coming in at a given direction, right? Again, on average, because I have millions and millions of particles, that's going to happen. And you can see this picture looks exactly the same. It's a momentum flux, right? There's still a, an exchange of momentum across uh, that cross-sectional area. And so by the same way that I get a pressure everywhere because of this exchange of momentum of fluids moving in and out fluid particles moving in and out. Okay, another 
uh, essential uh, concept is shear. Uh, this can also be aided by thinking about fluid as a particle, even though, again, we'll kind of move to a continuum. But imagine that I've got uh, here are some really fast moving fluid particles. And then I've got these kind of slower moving particles that are next to it, right? And these are molecules. Um, but there's going to be momentum transfer between them, right? And they're not, even though I drew them going this way, that's the primary direction. But we know these are molecules that have randomness. And so they're actually moving in all directions, just on average. This is the primary direction. So there's some momentum exchange, right? These particles are bouncing into some of these. And so uh, on average, what's going to happen is that these faster moving particles are going to get slowed down a bit by the slow ones, and these slow ones are going to get sped up by these fast ones. And so we get some sort of profile where instead of it being fast and then slow, right, uh, we would get some sort of smearing where we have, say, something more like this, right, where the velocities would be higher on top and lower on bottom. Well, the same thing happens as we pass towards uh, the ground or say a solid boundary. So here's a solid boundary that's not moving. Uh, and actually, let me just extend it all the way over here by these particles. Okay, and I shouldn't have drawn that one as if it went to zero. It wasn't really very accurate. So it looked maybe more like this, right? Faster and then slower. Uh, I'm having a hard time drawing today. Bigger on top, smaller on bottom. You get that? Okay, so let me erase that here. Now, if I go to the ground, it's the same thing, because remember, the solid object, it's actually made of molecules too, right? As we zoom in, there's a bunch of these molecules, but their speed relative to the solid object is zero, right? So the velocity here is zero. So in the same way, though, that these slow moving particles, they're going to exchange momentum as well with these particles that are not moving. And so they're going to get, these ones are going to get slowed down even more by the ground. And so we will get kind of this profile where at the bottom, it's going to go to zero, right? Right at the bottom. And this is called the no slip condition. Sorry, the handwriting is terrible. Let me try again. No slip. OK. Uh, and that occurs on any solid surface. And to be more specific, it's that the velocity is zero with respect to the surface. So. If I have an airplane that's moving, the velocity is zero in the frame of reference of that airplane, right? Because this is a, a moving body. Okay, so, and this is because of viscosity. Uh, and we've seen before, and we'll see this again in, in, in more detail, that uh, the shear stress, I shouldn't really call it a force, because it's really a stress. The shear stress is proportional, this is a proportionally constant to the velocity gradient. Right, so in other words, the velocity gradient is this slope here. Um, uh, this is that gradient, so as that becomes uh, steeper, which actually, because this is y and v is going this way, this is a steeper slope. You have to think about that for a second. But as that becomes steeper, the shear stress is higher, right? And this proportionality constant is uh, viscosity, uh, the dynamic viscosity. And actually, uh, we'll talk about a second coefficient of viscosity later in the semester. But for now, we're just kind of reviewing some of these fundamentals. So um, there are some idealizations we can make. Right? We've already talked about one, a continuum hypothesis. We can, going back to density, we could uh, make an assumption of an incompressible fluid. OK. This is an assumption that. For now, you've probably heard of it as constant density, and we'll use that for now. That is incompressible, but that's not really a complete definition. We can have fluids that are not constant density, which are incompressible, and we'll revisit that later. But this is an idealization. Uh, all fluids are compressible, but for many, the incompressibility assumption is a very, very good one, right? Uh, and that's something we'll make use of. Uh, for now, again, we'll think of it as constant density, although that's not exactly the case. Another related to shear is inviscid versus viscous, right? And again, viscosity always exists in our world, but an inviscid assumption for some cases will be a very good one and something we'll make use of as well. 
Okay, so these uh, forces and really uh, uh, stresses are uh, 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 these two things, these two stresses, right? Pressure and shear stresses are the only things that create all of the aerodynamic forces and moments or any fluid forces and moments, right? So lift and drag and pitching moments and yawing moments, all of these things, right? Are just a result of pressure and shear. Um, we normally think of, well, pressure always acts normal to the surface. Shear, we generally think of as tangential to the surface, and that is certainly its primary, primary, primary function, but you can have shear stresses that are also normal. Again, we'll talk about this in more detail later. Um, as it turns out, pressure uh, plays a huge role in part, well, really, because our atmosphere has such a high pressure. Um, so to use, um, generally we'll use SI units, but since many of uh, those in the US may be used to thinking about pounds and things, I'm gonna do this example in uh, imperial units. Uh, the atmosphere is about say 2000 pounds per square foot. So what that means is if I take a regular say sheet of paper, this type of area, not very big, and I, you know, you think of this as just an airflow or whatever. If I can create even just a 5% change in pressure, sea level pressure here, uh, then I can get, you know, about 50, 60 pounds of force generated by this. So I can get, a, you know, a small child, I could get them to carry their weight with just only a 5% change in pressure. And that's because, again, the atmospheric pressure is so large. Another way to visualize this is to uh, consider these three objects. These are cross-sectional views, uh, airfoils for the most part. So this is a symmetric airfoil uh, that's rather thick. And here's a cambered airfoil, that, which is much thinner, and it's also at an angle of attack. And this is a cylinder, right? just a circle. Um, and so in all cases, I've got you know some flow coming in this way. And if I put the Reynolds number, at say a typical number for like a, a, an airplane, actually usually even an order of magnitude higher than this for an airplane, but for many aerospace applications, let's just say at about a million, then in this case, these three objects all have the same drag, um, which seems really surprising, right? Uh, because they're very different sizes. Uh, but we can again understand this by thinking about difference between pressure and shear stress again. So for this shape here, these two airfoil shapes, they have a lot of surface area. So we expect that shear stress is kind of their dominant uh, form of drag, right? Kind of the shear stress along the surface. And the pressure drag is actually quite small. Conversely, the cylinder, very little surface area, very little shear stress comparatively, but lots of pressure. We'll talk about this again more next time, but um, because there's a wake that forms, right? The flow separates and I get this wake, then I get this region of high pressure up front and low pressure below. And remember, even a, just a small pressure difference can create a big force. So I get actually a huge amount of drag with even just kind of this, this small shape, but that it's blunt. And that's why aerodynamicists go to great lengths, right? To create streamlined shapes. You know, you'll see performance cyclists that will have uh, you know, many road bikes won't have spokes that are cylinders, they'll be tapered and they'll have helmets sometimes they're tapered and all sorts of things like that, right? Just to, because those little things can create a lot of drag. In fact, many World War I air, airplanes, right, really suffered from poor performance because the structures required a lot of bracing, struts and things, and they were just using cylindrical braces that were creating immense amounts of drag. So that's something we have to be careful of, right? Whereas with this airfoil, because of the streamlined shape, I don't have any aggressive curvature here. The flow can remain attached, and then I can get just this really tiny wake, so small pressure differences, and instead uh, I have mostly just skin friction drag. Okay, so uh, next time we'll continue talking a little bit about pressure and shear stresses, forces, uh, in a little more detail. That's good for right now.